section support. Uh, thanks, Greg. Overseas section support, honors, um, uh, and and membership, and a few other things. So, uh, if I haven't met you yet, hello. Um, I wanted to bring up a couple of quick things. First of all, we've gotten even even this moment, uh, we've gotten some questions asking about the effect of the government shutdown on AGU. If there is one, kind of looks like that's where we're headed, but if there is one, uh, we will get an email, all members from Lisa Gromlich. Um, uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and I don't have any eyes on it, so I don't have any preview, but we'll, we'll just know that a message will come out from AGU. The other question I have for you all is about uh, something that we'll talk about probably in another call or in another venue. But I wanted to find out, I've, I've been hearing, and possibly Sam has too, I don't know, that some sections are doing kind of mentoring and coaching programs on their own within their sections, kind of outside of the scope of some of AGU's work. And we wanted to try and connect with you all and kind of understand that. Um, so I'm gonna ask if any of your sections have a mentoring or coaching program, can you put your name in the chat and the name of the section so that me, Sam, Pernodi, whoever can maybe get back to you. And Sam, I know I'm throwing your name in here, but we can talk later. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, so you do have Kimberly has a mentoring or coaching program. Anyone else? And again, this is just to kind of get an idea and then we'll get back to you later. We may reach out to the broader section leader group uh, it, with another email or something like that, asking the same question. But since you're here, we thought we would ask. So no one else? knows of uh, having kind of a, oh, yeah, so career pathways, maybe that as well, anything around careers that you all are doing within kind of the, the I don't want to call it the bubble, but let's say the bubble of a, of a section as opposed to kind of a wider program. All right. Well, thanks, Kimberly. We will be in touch. <laughs> we'll probably be in touch with, with others as well. So thanks for that. Um, let's get started. And let's look at the agenda. Next slide. So um, again, welcome. Um, oh, thanks, Colleen. We'll, we'll note that as well. Um, uh, next, uh, let's go back to the agenda, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about honors innovations. I think a lot of you have heard about this, particularly if you are a section leader who's on council, we actually had something in the, um, in the, consent agenda at the last council meeting a few weeks ago, but we wanted to make sure that folks are hearing about this as we keep moving in uh, implementing these innovations. Then we're gonna talk about canvassing committees. Um, we have a few sections, thank you, who are here, Atmospheric Sciences and Biogeosciences, who are gonna talk about their canvassing committees, how they do things. We wanna really give more attention to that, that process that um, how people can reach out uh, in terms of nominations. Again, this is canvassing committees for the uh, uh, honors program. We're going to get an AGU 23 update, which we will have probably on each of these calls going forward through December, and then open mic. So why don't we go to the next slide and the next. Okay, so uh, myself and Leah, mostly Leah here, in, on, uh, one of my colleagues is going to talk to you briefly about the innovations for the honors program. Again, we'll go, we'll go kind of quickly because you probably saw this if you looked at your consent agenda package as council members, um, but we just want to make sure we're getting the word out as we are moving forward in, in implementing these. Uh, so Leah, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Hello, everyone. Um, Greg, next slide. All right, so I'm just going to give an overview of the innovations. Um, you can go to the next slide, Greg. All right, so um, as many of you are aware, um, over last year, uh, the Honors and Recognition Committee did a review of the Honors Program. Um, and the goal of that review was to align AGU Honors Program with um, our values and strategies. 
So the first part was really to understand the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the honors program um, in its current state. So what they did was they kind of reviewed the program, um, you know, to see um, where the strengths were, where the weaknesses were, and what were some of the opportunities for how we can um, improve uh, the program. This next part was to develop a, um, approaches that would improve improve uh, the sustainability of the program. So basically, how can we increase member engagement with the honors program? Where were there opportunities to bring more members into the honors program? How can we better showcase um, honorees? And are there opportunities to create new recognitions to um, promote um, awardees? And then also, how do we incorporate um, diversity, equity, inclusion into the honors program? The next part was to provide recommendations for how we improve the performance, value, and impact of the honors program. So basically with improving performance, that's how do we increase, you know, nominations? Um, how do we make sure that our honors um, align with the value of AGU? And how do we make sure that um, our, our recognitions are making an impact for the organization? Um, and then, of course, you want to ensure that the catalog of honors that we have um, are in alignment with AGU strategic goals. So um, that is also something that came out of the review. Next slide, Greg. So just real quick, I'm not going to go detail through the timeline, but um, this process really started in 2021. So it's been about two years. And it started with the um, chair of the h &R committee and staff having a conversation with council. And then last year, um, we partnered with uh, McKinley and we did a series of um, stakeholder interviews, benchmarking interviews, um, and that included various um, members such as, you know, past nominators, past honorees, committee members. It also included some section leadership. Um, and we did concept development and testing. Um, we were giving council updates throughout the process. Um, and then once we kind of went through and made the recommendations, um, the h and committee then selected a couple of innovations that they wanted to move forward with for 2024. And we did get um, member input on those innovations. So over the summer, we met with members from the global engagement community. Um, we met with members from um, the student and early career. We also met um, with some of the nominators um, also canvassing committee members, selection committee members to also get some input on some of these innovations that we are um, gonna move forward with. And where we are now is we're kind of fine tuning the innovations and we're preparing to uh, make the public announcement to our members about what these innovations will be for 2024. Um, and of course the goal is that in, 20, in 2024 for January, we'll be ready to launch these for the nomination cycle. Next slide, Greg. Um, and just to give an overview on what these innovations will be. So the first one is um, instituting a nomination review process to enhance the accessibility and equity of the Union Medals, Awards, and Prizes program. So that will consist of allowing for self-nominations in addition to the peer nomination process for all Union Medals, Awards, and Prizes. Um, the process now will include a two-step nomination review process the first round of the nomination process will um, be anonymized. So there will be anonymized submission in the first round. And the goal of this is to make sure that we're promoting um, fair scoring and reducing bias in the review. And then also another change um, that's gonna be part of the process is, is that we're moving away from letters of support and we're now replacing that with form filled questions that supporters are gonna be required to complete. And all of this will be in alignment with the new rubric that we're also incorporating for 2024. Um, and then that goes into the second bullet, which is that there is gonna be a standardized rubric um, for the Union Medals Awards and Prize Program. Um, and the standardized rubric is also gonna incorporate AGU's strategy and values. Um, so this is new for us. We're now gonna have this publicized. So the rubric will be um, available to view online so that everyone is aware of what, of how they will be evaluated. Um, the tool will, will have built-in flexibility. So for um, honors that have specific criteria, they will be able to incorporate that into the review process. Um, and then it also has qualitative and quantitative elements. And as I mentioned, AGU values are embedded in the uh, evaluation process. So now um, nominees will be evaluated um, 
will be required to be in alignment with AGU values as part of the process. And then the last piece is that's assessing um, the UMAP catalog. So we're going to be reviewing the catalog to make sure it is in alignment with AGU's strategic goals and values. Next slide. Oh. Uh. Well, thank you, Lydia. A lot, a lot of new information there. Uh, hopefully not new to you. We've been talking about this for a while through through uh, council and board, including the last meeting. We're we're very much in terms of these innovations with the honors program are very much in experiment, learn, adapt mode. The other piece that that Leah mentioned briefly is that you know we we are really going to look at how well these these innovations perform and how they do and what the impact is and if it doesn't work it doesn't work and if it does we'll expand uh, and there are other innovations that came up through the audit other recommendations we we had to prioritize so there are probably other things that we'll be doing in the coming year in 2024 but but look out for more information, Latoya Miles, who's the uh, committee, uh, the committee chair for the Honors and Recognition Committee, is going to be sending out uh, a from the Prowl to all membership uh, next week um, that talks a little bit more about this, including an FAQs uh, around the the honors process. So you'll you'll see more then, and you can always reach out to me and Leah directly with questions. Um, Julie, you mentioned, what, what do you mean by catalog? By catalog is basically what, what is the list, what's the inventory of all the honors that, that are administered by, by uh, AGU. So, um, but I would say in terms of looking at the catalog now, we are narrowing it to the union medals, awards, and prizes. It does not include fellows. Uh, and, and, and that's the whole program on, in and of itself. And in terms of the section awards, uh, and what we will do is see how this works with UMAP, Union uh, uh, Medals, Awards, and Prizes, and see what learnings we get to apply to the section uh, awards as well. So that's what we mean. Uh, so I'm just looking at another question. What is the timeline for making these changes uh, next week with the From the Proud post from Latoya Miles that I just mentioned? But if you are uh, on council or have been, have been on council or board, uh, or were one of the members who we interviewed uh, as we were getting input, uh, then uh, hopefully you you would have seen some of this information not for the first time. So, All right, let's talk about canvassing committees and we can ask more questions during the, um, uh, oh, can you mention these changes in, yeah, Bob, it's fine. I mean, we're again. You can you can mention it, and like I said, I think it's going to be on Tuesday when we send the uh, from the prow out to all the members. So it's fine if you want to talk about it today. All right. So let's move on to canvassing committee guidance. We want to hear from. Um, well, let me talk a little bit about what canvassing committees are. I think you all are aware, but let me just kind of set the stage, and then we want to have a robust conversation uh, with two of our sections who do this. Uh, and find out also from you all who are not giving the presentations what you all are doing or what questions you may have. So what is a canvassing committee? So they, it plays a vital role with AGU. Here's a list here. We wanna grow the honors program. We hope that the canvassing committees put into place uh, ways to recruit for you know, good nominations uh, in terms of increasing the diversity in candidate pool, you know, kind of throwing a wide net. Uh, bringing awareness to underrepresented honors uh, and ensuring that deserving individuals are recognized for their contributions. Next slide. So a little bit of background. I'm looking at the last bullet here. The majority of sections have some type of canvassing activity. Some of you have committees, some of you are doing things not maybe in a committee format, but maybe a little more informally. And there's some of you who don't have canvassing committees. So we would really like to understand what we can do to kind of help you stand up those that that function so that we get the most diverse pool of, of, um, of uh, nominations as we can in the pro program. So here's again, some, some guidance, um, at least on the AGU side, but again, we wanna hear what the sections do. So we recommend that there be at least three members of a canvassing committee. We, we know that there's some that are much more, which is great. Um, abide by conflict of interest policy 
um, the language below is new, actually just got approved by council uh, in the, in the um, where were we, September meeting. Um, members of canvassing committees are not eligible to serve as a member of an award selection committee that they canvass for. And members of canvassing committees tasked with soliciting fellows nominations are ineligible to serve on the union fellows committee. Um, the reason those are in there is that we found there were instances of both. <laughs> so we really needed to, you know, to kind of take care of those issues. Um, canvas for section awards and lectures, fellows programs, new map that align to their section. One of the things that I found just in the two years I've been here is that the canvassing committees tend to, and I understand why that might be the case, in the sections tend to glom onto fellows, right? But but we're, the hope is, is that, you know, it goes beyond kind of the fellows program and, and all of the honors. Um, it, it, I know it's a big lift, a uh, big volunteer lift and, and asking to do that. Um, also, you know, we ask that, that that your canvassing committee be in place by July so you can begin canvassing for the upcoming nomination cycle in case you don't know and this is something that will come up in our messaging next week. Uh, the nominations for 2024 honorees uh, nomina nomination submission begins January 17th. Uh, fall meeting may be a good place or AGU 23 to start talking and thinking about this in case you're seeing some folks uh, in person. Um, but we will be opening the, the um, nomination platform uh, called Open Water on the 17th um, that again, apply all of these new innovations like self nominations and a two-step process and all of those pieces. So I'm gonna stop there and go to the next slide. Keep going. So again, we're gonna have our section spotlight. But if you know, one of the things we're trying to do with this meeting, I mention this every month, is that we want the sections to hear from each other and make this a space where you do that. So that's what this is. Uh, but also for you all to, who are not necessarily presenting, ask questions, share knowledge. Um, uh, if you're not doing something that you need quite answers on, talk to your fellow sections here and continue after this meeting, however you need to connect. So that's one of the purposes overall of this meeting. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so Atmospheric Sciences, are you ready to talk about your canvassing committee? Yes, yes, I am. Perfect, thanks Tiffany. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Tiffany Shaw, and I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, and I'm currently the chair of the Atmospheric Science Canvassing Committee. Me along, myself and along with uh, eight colleagues, so we're quite a large canvassing committee, um, work hard at our job, which is pro bono, as was mentioned. Um, our can canvassing committee formed in 2019, so, you know, relatively young. And so what I've highlighted here are what I would uh, describe as our best practices. We learn this by doing, and these are always evolving. So in general, um, the committee is formed uh, sometime in the summer or early fall. And then we have our first uh, meeting, which are monthly in November. And we like to start this off since we have a track record now with the kind of wrap up of last year's award cycle. As you'll see in the subsequent slides, it's very important for us as a committee, or it has become very important for us to collect data and try to understand um, what's going on with the awards, um, particularly the fellows, or, although we do collect um, ideas about other uh, section and union awards. So we start there with kind of where we're at, what the most recent cycle looked like relative to previous years. So we have time series data. Then we provide the committees, committee members, uh, each of which is given a, a current spreadsheet of atmospheric science section members. And the committee members are asked to brainstorm potential nominees for both union you know, fellow and section awards that we accumulate and people can add these offline from the meeting in a Google spreadsheet, which is uh, protected in the sense that only certain people are allowed. And that's of course the committee membership, which does rotate somewhat. So that's what gets us started. And then during each monthly meeting, we go through that list, essentially talking through the potential nominees, discussing potential nominators for each nominee, 
Um, what we've, I think, accumulated is a useful kind of frequently asked question sheet when we may not know the nominee or who should be a good nominator. We kind of are guided by our own um, past successes or past experiences. We rely on, you know, how we might identify potential nominators through essentially, you know, from their institution who um, either department chairs or you know, someone senior to them who would have put together packages for, you know, tenure or other type of um, processes like that. So we begin to kind of match uh, the, the nominees with nominators. And then the role of each canvassing committee member is that they are assigned to reach out to a potential nominator after the meeting. And that's obviously by email. And that opens a dialogue. <laughs> or back and forth. Some people, of course, are too busy, they can't do it. And if they're reticent, we try to encourage them by offering resources. Uh, that includes our nominator tip sheet, literally breaking down a timeline for when they should be doing what, giving them templates to, on how to ask for letters, um, you know, who they should potentially ask for letters from, just example ideas. And then if they agree, they are um, so we each member who's assigned to a nominator it touches base with them approximately one, monthly to to encourage and help them overcome obstacles and offer assistance. Um, so this has essentially worked, I think, pretty well for us in this streamlined way. And if you go to the next slide, um, part of our activities have been, as I said, to try to collect data. Now I have to be a little frank here. Getting this data was not easy. It took me a long time <laughs> to get this data from AGU. Um, I think finally I have a path toward getting it regularly year after year, but if there's one thing that would be helpful for canvassing committees is somehow to just, once the awards are announced, this information gets sent because having to email over and over and over is not an efficient use of my time. But thankfully I am here and I have it. And I, I do thank Leah for her help in getting this data, because this is really important. And what it shows is the, in this case, the AGU Atmospheric Science Fellow nominations, female fraction as a percent um, over a number of years. I don't have 2023 yet, but as soon as I get it, I will add it. And our canvassing committee was formed in 2019. So this is obviously a good news story from this metric alone, although we don't have 23 yet. Um, and if you go to the next, slide, we start to break this down in terms of um, different stages, which is what the AGU provides for us um, for this particular metric. So at this stage is the number of AGU AS fellows forwarded to the union fellow committee, female fraction. And so we can see the signal is maybe not as clear from these data, um, but it seems to be going in the right direction. And then finally, the, the most important metric, which is ultimately how many um, in this for this metric again for female fraction, how many, how much of the fraction is um, female? And for twenty three, I do have this data because that is part of the honors announcement that I can just go and look at myself. So we hit forty percent this year, which is the the largest we've ever seen. Of course, we can't <laughs> claim any causality here. But I think this encourages us to keep going. And what we really want as a committee to break this down into different demographics and just look at the data in all sorts of different dimensions. Um, so I think I'd love to hear from the, the next section because sometimes I feel like we're in a void and I think we can learn a lot from each other. So I'm happy to hand it over. I realized I was on mute, sorry. Uh, let's talk more, Tiffany, thank you for that. And, and let's talk more about how we can get uh, sections content generally that will be helpful in, in running your canvassing committees and doing some analysis. Uh, Tiffany, we'll, we'll come back to you on that particularly, you know, individually to see what works. But if others of you have some ideas on what you might need in order to do this better or to do it at all, um, please let me know and, and maybe we can do something that helps all, all sections. So, so thanks for surfacing that. Um, so let's talk to Margaret, uh, who's gonna talk about biogeosciences and glad you're here. So why don't we have you present and then let's have open it up for everyone else to talk about what they do. Uh, Margaret? Hey, thank you, Rosa. Uh, 
So I sent some slides yesterday. Oh, there they are. Okay, great. And uh, also a poll, but maybe we'll do that at the end. So I'm representing the Biogeosciences Canvassing Committee. Uh, I'm the past president of the section and in our section, that person, when they become, the, when the president becomes past president, they become chair of the canvassing committee. And we've had a canvassing committee for, I don't know when we started, but at least uh, I think we'd say four or five administrations. So we're kind of an older one, but but much less organized than atmospheric sciences. So I was already taking notes. This is really good. Um, I think our goals are the same. We want to stimulate quality nominations and get people recognized and help the honors program be inclusive of all of the section science and people. So we have a couple activities that I'll add to what uh, Tiffany mentioned. One is we've actually changed an award to make it uh, more inclusive. We had an award that was limited to female um, nominees and we have, we opened it up to, to everyone who's a member, uh, but asked that it have an inclusive aspect to the activity that the person did. So we kind of moved where that focus was. And that resulted in uh, more nominations uh, and actually the many, still many more nominations than we got before, but they, and they were women, but it just somehow did spur. And we did a lot of canvassing for this award and tried to help people know that we had it. Uh, the DEI committee produced a really neat how-to series with several episodes and there you can watch them on YouTube. And we were very lucky. Rosa um, participated and, and quite a few other people. Uh, and then we do some advertising. I think for us, that's something we, we can keep doing better. And then we have one-to-one -one contact. In the past, we are we operated very much like atmospheric sciences with a large group. We brainstormed people who we could reach out to and we did reach out and then sort of provide how-to and advice and cheerleading. This year, well, we'd had a gap in activity and the meeting, the committee was dormant. So I tried to get people to join and uh, it was really hard. So I tried sending a message to people that said, hey, what if you knew that this committee had no meetings? Would you join it? And they did join and we tried to do things just by email and it didn't work very well because people didn't really follow up. I think they need that brainstorming phase that uh, Tiffany mentioned. Next slide, please. So then <laughs> we had a nice list of things we thought AGU could do to help. Number one, supply an up-to-date roster of the section where we don't again, have to ask for it. And it's an ad hoc request that must make a lot more work for AGU than if we knew in December, everyone was gonna get that password locked, protected, but up-to-date roster with the demographic information we need to identify who should get what kind of award. And then similar, provide statistics on member nominations and recognition. How are we doing? And um, then for individual awards, um, I've heard from people who did the nominating that they're not getting any feedback from the union committees, selection committees, and it's very discouraging to them. And then they're not nominating again. So they're, does that make sense? They didn't nominate, they nominate people, their people aren't selected and they don't know why. And I think you're revising this, but we also get feedback that the nomination process is um, hard to figure out all at once so that people are starting to make nominations and then they discover they're not eligible to be a nominator. But they don't know till they've filled out a lot of information and they're on the third page of doing something. It's not that much information. So it wouldn't look pretty, but I think it would be a lot more effective to have everything on one page. Just give me all the facts right here and now and let me fill it out. I think people can handle that. Uh, and then we, we think that for us, important communication would be to have people uh, from the 
AGU website be directed to our Connect website or vice versa so that we're really helping people find all the information about awards. I think the AGU main website, well, I know it does, it gets much more traffic for us than our section website. Uh, next slide. And then there's a lot that we think we can do better and what are our goals. Um, we wanna increase the number of nominations. We're a little under, I think, if, in most of them for the size of our section. Uh, we know that we need to maintain a large active canvassing committee so we can increase personal outreach. And um, we are not doing very well with international members. That's where I think we fall short. We actually are sort of demographics um, for male, female, that part actually looks pretty good. We've turned that around in the last four years or five years, um, but but international, we're not representing ourselves well and we have incredible international members. And I uh, wondered about how we can make our recipients more visible and maybe even more connected as a part of our section, not to, I don't know, a college of B section awardees might wall them off, but you know something more connected, but some interaction and fellowship and uh yeah i think maybe that's enough for speaking so that we have time for discussion all right thank you for that oh go ahead sorry you have more <laughs> uh, no that's okay i think um this was just telling us that we are doing okay in sort of the fraction of um you know of total nominations uh, but we're not doing very well in international. That's all I want to say. So you, I'm done. You can stop the slide. No, no worries. I, I wanted to also, I, I appreciate the the slide. And, and we talked, Margaret, a little bit about some of these when we, we did a pre-call as well and some of the okay. things that AGU can do. Um, so I appreciate that. And, and I, I do promise to, you know, over the next few months, kind of have us look at, at some of the feedback you've provided. Um, I hope one of the things I, I hope people are aware of um, is that, Gosh, just in the last few weeks, on September 13th, we launched an updated uh, updated web pages for the honors program, including a um, something called AGU, uh, our Honors Explorer, that that is a database that hopefully helps folks who are dealing with nominations and in, in terms of searching for information about awards and about past awardees. Yeah. And we're gonna, it, it's not there yet, but one of the things going forward, we also want to include our demographics that are transparent, publicly available, some of the stuff that we may be sending you via email ad hoc so that people have a better idea that's coming, but not yet. Um, and one of the things we recently did, kind of this is a farther away project, but is really looked, did an inventory of the section web pages. Um, and I think we need to take a closer look because uh, they're maintained differently by different sections in different ways. Um, including how the honors information is displayed. Now, I'll give an example of what, what we would love is that you all from your section websites just link over to the honors web pages for the updated honors information in those web pages, because then it'll be consistent, because right now it's not. Um, but there may be some other things we can think about too there. So, but we'll, we'll take a look particularly on the data piece um, and how we can share info, either you know publicly, like I mentioned, or to write to the sections. So let me stop there and, and maybe ask some questions. So I'm curious, how many of you have active section committee, I mean section, um, canvassing committees? Uh, do you have any questions that you have for Tiffany or Margaret, or do you wanna just kind of share what you do as well? You can put things in the chat or hands raised and just talk. <laughs> Anything? All right. Well, we hope this was helpful. Um, and if you do have questions, please reach out to, to Leah and myself and we can we can help in terms of may, maybe getting you more information in terms of how to be a more robust kind of activity for you, even though I know there's a lot already going on. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll come back to the, uh, the data, provision of data that might be helpful. So Margaret and Tiffany, thank you so much. I'm so glad for all the work you're doing in this space. It's a lot, I, I get it. So.
Um, I actually all have right. one. So let's. Can, oh. can you hear me, Rosa? Is there something in the? There's something in the chat. Um, let's see. I, I just had a follow up, or uh, one of yes, the points that I, Margaret I put on her slides that uh, she didn't really speak to, but it was yeah. about recognizing the nominators. And this is something that we've uh, thought a lot about in the cryosphere section as well. And I know that it's, it's probably fraught because the nominations are supposed to be confidential, but it would be really, really wonderful if there was a way uh, to, to recognize the work of, which is a lot of work at the, at the moment of these people who are really, especially yeah. very, there are several really prolific nominators. Um, and a lot of these nominators are, uh, you know, senior people who are doing this without a lot of recognition and junior people who are doing this without a lot of recognition. So I don't I don't know what the best way to do that is. I don't know if there is a way, uh, but I have discussed this with some nominators. And I yeah. I personally, as the when I was the chair of the fellows committee, I personally sent a message to each nominator saying, thank you so much for doing this nomination process. But if it would be awesome if there was some other way to do that. Uh, so I'm I don't have yeah. a great solution, but I, I just thought I'd bring it up as a as a thought. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I'm sorry I didn't. I'm having trouble seeing some of the some of my screens. I'm sorry to see you right away, but yeah, no worries. I, yeah, I agree. Um, and I, again, I've been here two years. I have. I think I've heard that in the past, as we plan kind of like the honor ceremony, you know, for the future at the at the formally fall meeting. I've heard that in the past there have been some nod to nominators. Um, so maybe we just need to look and see what that was and maybe brainstorm a few more ideas. But yeah, I, I have heard that from others as well. And I think it's a good point. So thank you. And I'm looking to see if there's anything in the chat. Lots of praise for, for uh, Margaret and Tiffany. So thank you. Um, thank you, Colleen, I agree too. Uh, John, let's see. Um, oh yeah, the repeatedly nominated and not selected. Um, yeah, I, yes, and I've heard that as well. Um, oh, and uh, Danny, you've got a question. Uh, you wanted to ask how long your canvassing committee member terms are. So yeah, Tiffany and Margaret. Tiffany, you wanna go? Sure, yeah, so um, Allison, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, she wrote in there, we're working toward three-year terms. It wasn't, that's a recent um, change. Yeah, when I when I started, we didn't really have any committee service terms. And so we've been trying to normalize a little bit it, because especially the canvas, it, canvassing committee is a lot of work. And so three years um, is, a, you know, that's a pretty big commitment, I think, for people. So we're trying to make sure that they can do that. And of course, if people want to stay on longer, they can, but we've been trying to work towards that. Another strategy we've been doing is we've been asking um, people who have been on our fellows committee when they sort of stop being on the fellows committee, which is even more work. Sometimes we can get people to agree to be on the canvassing committee um, because then they have a lot of experience with knowing what the fellows nominations look like. And so usually we don't have it like be exclusively that, but we'll usually have one or two people roll in from that as well. Yeah, Colleen, I don't. Colleen is here. She's our section president. Maybe she knows, but I don't think we've had fixed terms. And but on our other committees, we typically do three-year terms. Yeah, I I was on the canvassing committee about five years ago, and it was it was just uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, and then you were asked to stay on, um, but you didn't you weren't signing up for a particular term. I think having terms would be would be more useful because then you'd know who you could count on. Uh, for the next year, at least, you know, some core group of them. Yeah, actually, the hard part is when you're trying to introduce terms when there weren't terms before, is you just want to make sure that everybody doesn't roll off the same year and you have to like build in a stagger. And so that has been kind of challenging, but it's been it's been working, I would say. Thanks. That was really helpful. I, I think that um, informatics has a really small committee that to the best of my knowledge, didn't have terms and we just lost most of the committee members. Um, and, and so any, you know, any guidance I think would be, would be great, including incentives on how to constitute the committee, um, you know, or at least just build up that membership. Because I, I think it's really challenging to find folks who have the, the deep networks to be able to, 
you know, execute the the committee goals well. So thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I would just say one thing that we've we've tried to do is that I'll often to get on awards, people who've recently won the awards. So usually with fellows, we wait a little bit longer, but when people have received the award, they're a lot more likely to serve on the committees. Yeah, we've we've done that for fellows. If you if you're an awarded a fellow, then you, we know your address for sure or something. Uh, and uh, Jonathan and hi Jonathan, uh, we in um, biogeosciences we have the same recruiting that the past president becomes the head of the canvassing committee. And I had something on my slides about mind the gap. It's a little bit of an issue for us that the um, when the president who will become past president should be uh, starting to recruit in December, that would mean that the president elect has to tell their president, hey, will you please start doing this extra job now? So in the year that we roll over from, you know, from one administration to the next, uh, we've had a little lull in our canvassing. So that's just a little gap that we have to figure out. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say, I just want to throw this in because this is something that Tiffany and I have talked about too, is that the timing for like the canvassing is a little bit, you know, different. Like AGU asks us to get our committee lists for January 1st of every year. So usually we're timing our committees to be on like a calendar year. But in fact, with the the way the fellows go, we found like a sort of staggered year is a little bit better because like Tiffany's saying, like the main work really starts in November. Um, so we've been often assigning that canvassing committee, like those responsibilities are like starting on the half year. Mm. It's probably okay. good for people to know that you found that November is a good time to get started for fellows. That's a good tip. Thanks everyone. And I want to make sure we get to the, the next topic. And if we've got some extra time in the open mic, we can kind of keep talking about this. I'm seeing some really good chat and ideas uh, and maybe a few questions we still need to get to in, uh, in the chat. Um, but I'm glad we had this conversation. We're glad to support on the AGU side as much as we can. And yes, we've heard it too. We uh, Obviously my team and I work a lot with volunteers and I know that the volunteer um, list is and, and the, the work, it, it, the, the concerns are real um, in, in terms of, of all of that you do. We appreciate it um, very much as well. Um, so let's do an update. As I mentioned, each of these calls through the end of the year, we'll have an update on AGU 23. So we've got Suzanne from the meetings team again who I think joined us last time as well to give us a quick update. So Suzanne, you wanna get us started? Yeah, thank you, Rosa. Good morning, everyone. Um, we were 94 days out um, to um, until we opened sessions. So time is going by very quickly. It's hard to believe that it's gonna be October. Um, next slide, Greg. Uh, some key milestones, you've seen these before, but um, just to note, um, the program will go live next week. We will have acceptance letters also going out uh, on the third. Uh, we also, just a reminder, the early bird deadline is the 2nd of November. Um, for government employees, that um, early bird rate is honored throughout the meeting. And then another key deadline um, is the housing deadline, uh, which is November uh, 15th. And just a reminder, you know, if you haven't booked your housing, get in there because uh, housing is going very quickly. If you have any, you know, struggles with uh, booking your housing, uh, please reach out to us and we'll work with our partner um, to find you the best accommodation. Next slide. Okay, so we just announced our um, plenary lineup this week. Um, everybody should have received a mail, uh, email. Um, we have Amitav uh, Gosh from, uh, he is our presidential forum. Um, he is an author of um, 20 or more books, um, such as The Circle of Reason and The Great Derangement, Climate Change and Unthinkable. And then we have also have another publisher, Stephen Pine, who will be our Frontiers lecture on Tuesday. And he deals with uh, books that um, are on fire. And then the on Wednesday, we have uh, Lisa Gromlich. She's gonna lead our DEI plenary panel. 
And then Thursday is our art and science plenary, uh, Rebecca Mendez. She's an artist um, and she will be um, talking uh, on Thursday. And then we have uh, Pam Elroy, who is the NASA deputy administrator, who will close out um, the meeting on Friday. Next slide. All right, so I think the last time I did kind of give you an overview of um, space um, at Moscone Center, but I wanted to focus also on the exhibit hall this year. Um, we put placed our AGU central area in the exhibit hall this year, so they will follow the um, exhibit hall hours. Um, and in this area, you're gonna be focusing on a theater, which we will have scheduled programs throughout the week um, that will include from the Career Center to exhibit um, presentations. Um, and then we also have um, the Career Center will be next to the theater. We have the Open Science Pavilion, Brain Date Lounge, and we will also have the wellness area. And other highlights that are in there are the Puppy Play Zone and Headshot Lounge, which is very popular. And next slide. And the next slide is just kind of giving you an overview of um, the area, just kind of give you a different view of how it's laid out. But we really want to try to drive traffic to these areas. It's in the exhibit hall. Um, and, you know, hopefully people will be able to, you know, we're going to try to push to um, get people over in that area. Next slide. Okay, a um, lot of questions that we get um, at this time and throughout the summer, um, people looking for meeting space. And one of the things, um, we have several options this year. Um, we have the ancillary meeting room request, which is a form that is um, available on our website. Um, there is a fee for the um, space and the space is located at either at the Marriott or the Intercontinental Hotel. And we have a team of people who will work with groups to um, locate a space, work with them to make sure that they are all set up uh, for their meeting. And then we also have the meeting rooms located in the North Lobby. These are uh, rooms that are, um, they're, they're just set up max conference style. Um, they accommodate about 10 people and it's a first come first serve sign up um, outside the door. Um, and this has been popular for many years, um, you know, because it's, you know, you get on site and you want to meet with, you know, your colleagues. Um, this has always been an opportunity for um, small groups to meet. And then we are continuing the um, pod engagement areas. Um, this year we will have um, in the poster hall and also over in the West uh, building in the alcoves. Um, so we'll have the pods set up in on the second floor and the third floor and west. And those um, the reservation system will be available um, late October. And then new this year, um, we will have uh, poster, ha poster hall parks. Um, this is kind of just to give you a visual of what these parks are going to look like. Um, we're still you know, working out uh, the design, but um, it also includes nooks, um, which are, um, I think many of you probably saw last year, we had nooks in AGU Central um, and throughout the, the hall, the poster hall. But these are opportunities for people to, you know, engage with each other. And then we'll also have the uh, library, uh, which will be located in the um, poster hall area, which will be a quiet space. It's not right in the poster hall, but it will be kind of back into um, a, a quiet space in the poster hall. And one thing that's not here is um, what we're gonna be doing is registration in South. We will um, have on Sunday and Monday, we have uh, registration scan and goes that are gonna be available. And then after Monday, we are gonna turn those tables into um, engagement areas for people to have the opportunity to meet with you know their colleagues throughout the week or just to work um, if you're just looking for a space to um, sit down and work on your computer. Next slide. 
Okay, so Camp AGU is back. Um, we just posted the um, application on our website. This is something that AGU does subsidize. Um, and you know, we're we're looking forward to having um, the children back at the meeting. Um, so if you you know you see little kids running around, it's Camp AGU. Next slide. Okay. The other thing I wanted to just bring awareness to is we have a student volunteer program um, that is um, available for you know students who have um, already registered, but they're looking to help, um, you know, get uh, free registration. And we've had this program for several years. Um, there's a requirement that they have to commit eight hours um, through the week. And the positions that we have available are the iPoster help desk, the poster hall evening assistant, and the poster hall help desk, as well as the brain date lounge and assistant. Um, that application will go live um, October 4th, and um, we will um, we have a, uh, a team of people who will work at reviewing and um, making sure that you know, we have the appropriate people in those positions. Um, the, the students do have to register for the meeting, and then after they commit, after they do their eight hours commitments, um, we will reimburse them in January. Next slide. Okay, just an update on your section events. Um, again, your section events will take place between the Marriott Marquis and the Intercontinental Hotels. Um, Greg and Josh um, have been monitoring the ticket inventory just to make sure that, you know, it was the status of where we are, if we're selling out, if do we need to increase the inventory? It's also based on the space um, and your budget. Um, so they're reviewing several um, things when they're looking at the ticket inventory. Uh, the other thing, um, just to keep in mind, um, lo logistics are gonna be shared mid-October to all our vendors. So at this time we are no longer making um, changes or accepting events because we have to get all our, um, logistical specs to the vendors um, at this time. And then just to give you an overview of the food and beverage, we have a deadline of November 9th, where we give um, the headcount to the caterers. And when we have that, um, there's no, replen no replenishments on site, um, you know, because the catering, you know, they order ahead now and it's gotten really tough um, since COVID. Um, so, hotels and caterers, they're always, um, they're asking for numbers sooner than later. Uh, the other thing during your event, um, we will have the catering team and our staff monitoring the food stations throughout your events. Um, and, you know, we will make judgments like if we see one event is running low on food, you know, we'll work with the caterer to kind of shift things around. Um, the other thing for the flow for Tuesday evening, um, everyone has their own meeting space um, and we'll have signs outside of each of the doors to help kind of give you guys directional. Um, but again, we will have the open foyer areas to accommodate additional bars and food within each neighborhood. And this will give kind of like that feel with the neighborhood that it's, you know, open to everyone. Um, it'll flow, you can you know, flow between sections um, in each of the rooms and you'll be able to identify because we will have signs outside each room. Next slide. Okay, and just to um, give you an update, uh, we just did a site visit in San Francisco. We did our final site visit. It went really well. Um, the city, you know, I know the media, um, you say a lot of things on um, uh, the news, um, but around the convention center, we saw a lot, I mean, they, they're really trying um, to clean up the area. And um, we just, you know, we have been working closely with the city of San Francisco, the city's um, visitor bureau, San Francisco travel, um, that the hotel council, um, the um, San Francisco police. Um, so there's like a team of people that have been in discussions um, this last year and we'll continue the discussions through the meeting. Um, we will um, 
the San Francisco um, Travel has an ambassadors program, which when you get to the city, you're going to see people in orange jackets and you know, they're on the streets and they're helping you get to um, the Moscone Center. Um, or if there's any, you know, concerns or anything, you can always approach them and ask them questions. They're there to help um, our attendees. Um, when we were there on our site visit, we saw them on every corner, um, which was very, you know, it's nice because it kind of gave everybody that um, the feeling of security and, you know, watching people um, be able to get um, directional to the convention center. Um, the other thing that we're working with is the San Francisco Police Department. Um, they are going to be providing additional staffing, staffing and patrols during the week um, around the hotels and the convention center. Um, in addition to that, we also are going to have a map, a walking map that will show uh, attendees where to walk, um, you know, towards the convention center, the best directions. And we did that in 2019. Um, the hotels were distributing these walking maps, which I think are very helpful. Um, and then last, um, we continue to work with um, our risk management team, Astria. Um, they've been involved with us since um, 2021. They've been on site with us. Um, they're a great um, team of um, uh, security. They're not, a, they're not our security team because we hire additional security but they manage um, all like from the, you know, when we were doing the COVID, um, the verification, um, they were helping us with um, the EMS, um, the security team. Um, so they add a lot of value. They're an extension of our team, um, but you will see that team on site as well. Next slide. Yeah, so that is all I had, but I don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, there are a couple in the, uh, thanks, Suzanne, there's a couple in the chat, and, and we're like one minute away from top of the hour, so maybe we can answer these two questions and then uh, be respectful of time and close yeah. out here. But um, one question is, is the student volunteer program for all students or just undergrads? It's all students. Okay. Uh, the other is, oh, I think Ricky may have answered, thank you. Um, is there scheduled programming in the Career Center? Yeah, they're, um, Ricky, I think, you're saying just program. finalizing it. Yeah, let's see if there are any more questions here. Uh, John asks, are student volunteer opportunities undersubscribed or oversubscribed? Um, Deb, I don't know if you're on here, if you could, because you manage, like, what is the turnout for that? Oh, she may not be on here. I'm on. Sorry. Can you repeat the question? Can you hear me? Yes. Are they, um, what is it, oversubscribed or undersubscribed, the volunteer? Yeah, if the uh, student... Yeah, the student, how, yeah, what's the volunteer, student volunteer opportunities? Are they under or oversubscribed? What's the interest? Um, so we haven't fully launched yet. Um, I'm getting kind of uh, general inquiries through our meetings inbox, um, but the full application will go out in October. Yeah, and I mean, we get a lot of people, there's some that, you know, will, apply and then we don't hear from them or you know we've had instances where they've signed up and you know we've had no shows but we've also been able to reach out to um the volunteers um that um were interested and able to um accommodate them so i think you yeah, know we get a lot but um i think basically um we've been able to, we have been able to fulfill um all the spots over the years. And it's a great um, opportunity because it's behind the scenes. They get to work with our staff. They get to see, you know, they get to yeah, meet members, um, you know, when they're, especially in the poster hall, because you're all over the poster hall talking to um, attendees. Okay, great. 
Well, I think um, we are past time. So I'm going to go ahead and close out because we probably don't have time for open mic, but hopefully we got to a lot of your questions. Uh, Danny, I saw your note in here. Um, so uh, let's let's chat. And, and it sounds like you're asking for kind of like more operational discussions um, across sections. Is that is that right? If you're still here, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, let me uh, let me take that to also to um, Cheryl uh, on our team uh, in governance where we may be able to collaborate on something like that. So with that, I want to thank everyone. I see everyone's kind of leaving. Um, and uh, as usual, let me know what topics you have for these meetings, because usually that's what ends up in these meetings. So we need to hear from you what you want to hear. Have a good one. Thank you so much, everybody.